Um, I want to start um, by reading out of Revelation 12. <clears throat> this class is actually Law and Grace, but we've been in the book of Revelation, and we've been there because we see that the book of Revelation reduces everything down to beasts and lambs, beasts and lambs. And, and you're, you're either one or other of those, or you are a follower of one or the other of those, and that's what the book of Revelation is really um, identifying. And, um, <clears throat> and I want to I want to talk in this class and probably the next class about the story of the war in the book of Revelation, the story of the war, um, because um, clearly there is a war going on in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> And um, most Christians think that our goal is to win the war. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, but that's not really the goal, and we'll find that out in reading these scriptures and going through the story of the war. And what will we find out? That as, that as warriors, we are lousy. <laughs> we are lousy warriors. <laughs> that the enemy is stronger, smarter, wiser, better, faster. And uh, so he, um, <clears throat> so uh, let's just, we're just going to go through some in chapter 12 right now, and then we'll circle back to some of these things. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And verse 10, And I heard a loud voice <clears throat> saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down who accused them before our God day and night. Okay, so we get that part. And then um, uh, verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seas. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that his time, that he hath but a short time. Okay, and then uh, let's go ahead and read 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the male child. And then verse 17, the last verse in that chapter. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right. So um, maybe I should just read a little bit here because I really would like to finish this little thing. This is, this is actually going to cover a major portion, not just chapter 12, but a major portion of the book of Revelation, and we'll give explanations through it. And the only reason why I'm doing that is because, I don't know, I may only have two more times to share before this class is over with. So uh, is it something close to that? Three? Okay, you look and I'll read. In this section, we simply want to go through the book noting the different places that it mentions the word War. Who? Good God. What is it good for? By doing so, we will be brought to a realization that the greater part of the war involves defeat and apparent loss by God's people. But as we have noted thus far, those losses are actually victories for the Lamb in our lives. Victories for the Lamb. And that's where we have to comprehend Him the Lamb of God, not just know that he's called the Lamb and not just uh, recognize that he laid down his life um, and 
but how he applies that. You know, we always say, what would Jesus do? I don't know. He's almighty, all sufficient, all knowing. How am I going to know what Jesus would do? You know, that's why mine says WWJD, what would Judas do? I can figure him out. <laughs> but, but I don't know. It's not a matter of figuring out what he would do. It's a matter of letting him live in us so he can do that. And um, so it must be understood that the lamb on the throne, the martyrs who stand before that throne, the two witnesses, and all the slain are one ongoing conflict with the dragon has against us. We must also recognize that these all who have been slaughtered are all of one spirit, lamb. You have to recognize that all of, when it comes to the saints in the book of Revelation, all of it has to do with selfless giving, with laying down your life, with releasing something spiritually that will, will bring about change and affect things. Um, the enemy will be slain by the by the dawning of a new kind of power that scatters the darkness, and that power is the power of the cross. But until then, he has the power to slay, but by doing so, he slowly un unleashes his own destruction. All right, so I want to look at two scriptures that would be familiar to some of you and maybe not to others. Keep your places here, if you will, but um, let's go first to... Isaiah chapter 14 and the scriptures we're going to read from are going to give you the beginnings and the endings of the war okay the beginning and the ending of the war Isaiah 14 And let's start at verse 12. <clears throat> How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, who didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to hell, to the, to the sides of the pit. They that See thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who did shake kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who opened not the house of his prisoners? And so you, you, you see the beginnings of the war. This is the beginning of the war. This is how it began. I will... You know, God is, God is the I am, he's the I will. And he puts his will towards that end. And he makes up his mind that he, um, the, the way I've always looked at it is, he has looked at God and never known God. That's the way I see it. He doesn't know God. He doesn't know him. All he sees is that God sits on the throne of everything, that God has all power, that God, all these I wills that, that are there, and that's what he calls God. But he doesn't know that that's a lamb sitting on that throne. He doesn't know the nature of the being that is God, which is just the opposite of that. Jesus said, I will come down. I will become like a man. I will be crucified. I will, you know, make, be you know, lose my reputation. <clears throat> All of the things, just the opposite of this spirit. So there's a new spirit that is released now and that has begun. And, and uh, God says, uh, you know, don't worry, this, you're not, it's not going to end this way. It's not going to end this way. And so we see some of that end uh, as well as some of the beginning over in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28. 
Ezekiel 28, <clears throat> beginning with verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, so I've, I, I hear people, and I'm, we're going to read on, and it'll, it follows suit with what we just heard. I've had people say, well, that's, not, that's talking about the king of Tyre. But they'll, they'll sit there and use other scriptures that have a spiritual meaning, you know, that have a spiritual meaning, and feel free to do that, but then they can't see that the king of Tyre wasn't in the Garden of Eden. No mention of the king of Tyre walking around going, there's a serpent over there. I want to be like him or something weird, you know. No, no mention of that. <clears throat> this is long, 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 many, you know, hundreds, probably thousands at this stage of years. And it is God speaking to the spirit that is within the king of Tyre, the being. And, he's, and, and you know, what he says here of him is, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sun some full of wisdom and perfect in beauty that was that was lucifer that was satan before the fall perfect in beauty perfect in beauty i could use a little dose of that but since it's since it caused him to fall i'm going to stay away from that <laughs> Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphires, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy timbrels and of thy flutes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. And so there are those who say that Satan led the worship of God, or Lucifer led the worship of God before he fell and became Satan. That he was, he could, he could play an instrument, <laughs> he could play instruments. That he was proficient in that and, and led the worship. It doesn't say that he led the worship here, but it does say, it does equate him with music and music in heaven before the fall. So I would assume that it's kind of like what we'd call worship. Um, thou art the anointed cherub. Well, there it is. Come on. <laughs> thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Remember, the other one said, I will be, I will ascend the mountain of God. <clears throat> Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy merchandise. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. 
And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be appalled at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Interesting that the picture that it gives of the fall of Satan wasn't because of vileness per se, but was because of his great wisdom and because of his great beauty. That pride and this spirit can arise in us, begin to set us in a place that's not in the image of Christ, it's another image. God said, let us make man in our own image. And the serpent, which was Satan, set forth another image. Yea, hath God said, do we have to listen to that? You know? And, uh, you know, we can, people can pursue God but if we don't pursue him on the right basis, we're missing it. We say, well, I'm pursuing God. I'm pursuing God. But if, if something is setting forth an image that is the exact opposite of the Lamb of God, it is more like, I'll just say it, it's more like Satan in the sense that it wants to be ascend and it wants to, to uh, rise up and it wants to be something and it wants to be known as beautiful and it wants to be all of these things that frankly the world touts now particularly and says it's okay and the church even does it churches do that um, unknowingly are violating the very heart desire of the Lord who said let us make man in our own image and after our likeness so the first sin wasn't just sin which we always, the church world always thinks about. Sin, it's all about sin. I don't want to fail God, this and that. No, no. It's about missing the heart of God in relationship to oneness, in relationship to his image, his likeness, something that when he sees shining from us, touches him in a way that nothing else can, can do it. That's where we get the book of Revelation and the wife of the lamb. That's where she comes from. She comes through those valleys and she keeps pursuing and she keeps loving and she keeps longing and it draws out her heart for him to be in his image, to be in his likeness, to, to be more than what the world would say, that's, that's beautiful, you know. What does he say is beautiful, you know. <clears throat> All right. So, I said, let's, uh, let's begin now to look at various scriptures on war. Notice the relationship of the beast to the two witnesses made war and shall overcome. So this is, we're back to Revelation, but this time Revelation 11. Revelation 11 and just verse 7. I mean, it's all here, but we're just going to note verse 7. And when they, sh it's talking about the two witnesses, those who stand for God. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. So here, um, this, this, this quite possibly could be the first use of the word war in the book of Revelation. I think it might be. And it is um, against the two witnesses who are making a stand in the earth, but not just making a stand, but are prepared to bear the spirit of the lamb into death so that something could be released here and end up doing so. But if you're a nominal Christian and you read this and everything else that we're going to cover here, it looks weird because we think the book of Revelation is all about us defeating the devil. And the vast majority of the book is about the devil defeating us, but for, with purpose. We allow it 
will, willing sacrifices because we understand the nature of God, not just you know the the Christian teachings. Um, all right, and then some that we read already, but chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Well, there's all of his names in case you don't know him. I'd like to introduce you to him. There's his nickname and his middle name. Um, anyway, <laughs> who deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. Um, let's see. Let me just make sure. All right. So the war mentioned here is between angels. This is this has abs this war right here has absolutely nothing to do with believers. This is read it. Michael the archangel takes Satan and casts him out of heaven from before God into the earth. Um, the devil is cast out of heaven. His anger over this action by God has caused him to take it out on God's seed in the earth. Before this, he was only, uh, he only accused us. But now he makes war with us. Remember, it says that he stood before and he was the accuser of the brethren and accused us day and night. But now he's been cast down and now he's making war. Uh, so to, to try to stir up our carnal minds, God is safe in heaven, but allows the enemy in our midst, even as in the Garden of Eden when he made it perfect, but there's a snake in there. What's up? You, you see what I'm saying? Most Christians, this, all this stuff doesn't make sense to them, you know, because they're not trying to be conformed to the, to the spirit of the lamb. They're trying to become great. Admit, not everybody, you know. I, I don't know the number. <laughs> but there are those. There are those. Uh, and they're substantial. <laughs> I'll, I'll read this again. God is safe in heaven. but allows the enemy in our midst. If the Garden of Eden was perfect, have you ever asked the question, how did the devil get in there? <laughs> or why, or you know, God, this is first big gig. Excuse my music background. This is first deal. Let us, let's make the earth, let's make all of this, and let's, you know, universe, and then earth, and then the cream of the crop, let's make this garden. And let's put what we want in our image in this garden. And he doesn't, you know, he, he could just put a big bubble over the thing where the, Satan couldn't get in there. You know, big clear dome. Something. But it didn't do that. There he is. And we say, if you, if you, you know, now if this is about sin, you go, well, then why'd you put the devil in there? You see what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. If this is only about not sinning, then why would you allow that devil in there? But it's not just about sinning. It's about coming to that image and you can't come to that image in a perfect place thus Babylon the purpose of Babylon when Israel went into captivity all with intention to form us into his image <clears throat> okay uh, and then let's see and then verse 10, right after that, he's cast down with his angels, and he's upset, the devil's upset. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. Now, they're going, now is the kingdom. 
And you're going, look, he just talked bad about us before this. <laughs> but he talked bad about us to God, so I wasn't too fearful. Now he's here. Now not the kingdom. Now the devil. Now things are bad. Now things are way worse. And uh, let's see. Let me just read this then. Also in these verses we hear, Now comes salvation, strength, kingdom, and the power of his Christ. And they, and they overcame him. See, that's, let's see. Let me make sure. Yes. So the next verse after that is, For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him. Him who? Okay, we can pull this verse out and just tack it anywhere we want to, or we can use it in the context of the Bible that says we overcame this one who was cast down, that this is the beginning of the victory for us, that, that this is with purpose. Amen. Now is come the kingdom. Now this thing's going to be worked in us as government, kingdom. And now we're going to start singing the power of his Christ, Hallelujah. which is the cross. Amen. God. Either that or those people in heaven are crazy. <laughs> it's either God that or some mystical reason why throwing Satan down here with us and making him mad in the process, <laughs> you know, because that, especially the, the average Christian mind does not, does not work out to, you're just kind of going, uh, I think the devil wrote the book of Revelation. I mean, that's what we'll come up with, something like that. No, John wrote it. And John saw, he was caught up, and he saw realities as they were in God's heart. He didn't see everything according to the earth anymore. He was taken out of it so he could see on a different level. And, as, and, if, and, if, <laughs> and if you get caught up there, this book will change. It will change. So... So we got, oh, and they overcame him. And so we go, yes, the devil's cast down, but we're going to overcome him with the weapons of our warfare. We're going to kick devil butt. You know, we used to say, I, you know, I'm going to give the devil a black eye. Don't, don't hack him off. <laughs> a black eye is not going to stop him. You know what I mean? It's going to take a little more than that. But it's not going to take more powerful weapons to blow him away. That's the way of the world. That's the way man thinks. It's going to take the inworking of the cross so that it outwardly manifests. And so that's where we get in. They overcame him by threefold thing. The blood of the lamb, the, the, the blood of an innocent, non-fighting creature, the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and I think I wrote this here, and they overcame him, the one placed among us, by innocent blood being shed, a martyr testimony, and not loving their lives to avoid death. Okay. It all has to do with death. All three of those things have to do with death. The cross is the power of God. The cross is the answer. And the order of this leading up to what we just read in verse 11 is amazing because it clearly shows God has a plan and this is how he's going to carry it out. I put they overcame him. These three things mentioned here are their means of victory. All right. Now we can hear this in in um, we can hear this in class. We can we can write notes on it. We can believe this because the spirit bore witness when I heard it from Brother Randy's mouth. But 
But if this isn't worked in us, if it's not kingdom, if it's not government, we won't even, we won't even recognize what is the serpent, the, the devil, that old serp, serpent, you know, what, all that. We won't even recognize that uh, spirit. We might be sucked in by a spirit that wants to promote us through somebody else. Because we have a spirit in us that wants to be promoted instead of that is, and why? Um, well, if I'm promoted, I'll fix everything. <laughs> I'll, I will, I'll be able to fix it. I don't know what's wrong with Brother Randy, but I, you know, and let me give you a little warning here. I've had people tell me that, and I turned it over to them, and I said, okay, fix it. I have. I have. Take it all. If you can fix it, do it. But if I'm the one that God put in this place for this, I'll be back. <laughs> Not to take it from you. You'll be screaming, take it, take it. And I've also told others, as the Lord led, I, yeah, I tell you what, if you believe that that method is the one that will work, and this one is the one that will fail, then you go out there and you prove it to me and I will repent. I'll get on my knees and kiss your feet. I will repent. If you, if you can put those things you just said to work and make something come that will last, I promise you, I will repent. And it, it never happened. It never happened. Why? Because Randy knows best. No, I don't know best. I, don't, I barely know Jesus. I'm just getting to know him. But I know that the word is true. And I know that the spirit of the lamb is the most powerful thing. I know that. So I, can't, I won't be able to be deterred from that. I know that it is. And I am knowing, and I am knowing it. When I say I know it, I don't mean I know all there is to know. I just mean I know and am knowing. Okay, so, um, and then verse 17, And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which is his, who, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony. And that word testimony is the same word used for martyr that bear the image of the lamb, that in bearing it, it testifies of the slain lamb on the throne. It's not just good Christianity or right way of living. It is a bearing of the actual nature and way of the lamb, even unto death, that will testify of the one God exalted, the slaughtered lamb on the throne. That's what it is. All right. So uh, the dragon's reaction of being cast out of heaven, he is wroth with the woman, no longer just accuses, but makes war, but makes war, makes war. Okay, come on. Somebody can get mad at you and... and even, you know, shoot a, put a couple of bullet holes into your house. I'm sure none of you will experience that. But growing up in Oak Cliff, I have. And, um, you know, they can do that. Or, or on the chalkboard, put a couple of holes in there. They can do that. But making war is like somebody declares war on you. And if you're already struggling... This doesn't sound so good. And I wrote, makes war with her seed who keep guard and keep their eyes on the commandments. Because that word keep is to keep your eyes upon. And have the same testimony as Jesus Christ. Who wants to go to war? God could have avoided this. 
I'm trying to go back to the carnal mind now and, you know, give you, maybe say it before you do. <laughs> Who wants to go to war? You know, this, this realization, God is almighty. Satan is a fallen angel. He's not God. If it's a power struggle, a God will win over a created angel every time. It won't even be close. Why doesn't God do something? Or why would God, why would God cast the devil down here with us? Why the devil would he do that? <laughs> and why us? And why here now? <clears throat> because he has a plan and he has a purpose and he works all things according to that plan. It says that in Ephesians chapter 1. All right, so um, chapter 13, and let's look at verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon who gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All right, can anybody recall in the book of Revelation any army or other countries coming against the beast and his army? See, who can make war is talking about you and me, talking about a bunch of lambs. Look at these lamb idiots. Who can make war against this monster of a beast? Look at this is, there is no contest. We got it. We win. USA. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> couldn't resist. <laughs> so who can make war back against the beast? Certainly not little lambs. And it says he, uh, verse, let's see, let's go to verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay. So what you have is a consistency so far of testimony that the war isn't going well. Or, in light of the Lamb, had, had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because that was their downfall. They wouldn't have crucified. Ah, let's not do that. They still don't know because they don't understand like this. And so this is the beast. So he's, we'll just slaughter them all. <laughs> it's like, what is this? Day of Atonement? Thousands of lambs going up. Hallelujah. <clears throat> um, let's see, what did I read? Uh, seven. Let me read... Um, Five and six before that. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. Well, what's the tabernacle of God? He's not sitting there outside of an old building going, You, you, are, you son of a lamb. Um, we're the tabernacle of God. We're the habitation of God. We're where he's located. We're where people can find him. And then verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So I wrote, Part of this war is done with his mouth to speak against God and his tabernacle, his dwelling place. Part of this war is his mouth. The people will believe these beasts because they have the power, while the saints, who are supposed to have God's backing, clearly don't have, don't, because they are weak and helpless. Does that make sense? that the people would go, well, here's the winners. Here's the guys that's going to win. I, I always want to go with a winner. You know? And this guy, nobody can stand before him. 
And these guys claim to have God with them on their side, and they're weak and easily slaughtered, and God doesn't do anything, so I don't think they got God on their side. Is that a replay of any other time in history? Well, yeah. Yeah. And it always comes down to those that know the Lord and know his spirit and know his way. They're conformed to the image of Christ. They're conformed to the Lamb. And in so doing, they will, they will take up their cross and follow him. And follow him where? Well, into death. Usually anybody who took up a cross in, in Roman rule territory meant they're going to be hung on it. Remember, Jesus had to carry his own cross. You know, you take up your cross. Oh, boy, I'm taking up my... You go, you're supposed to die on that thing. You know, stop dragging it around. <laughs> Get up on it. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's go to Revelation 17. <clears throat> Revelation 17 and verse 14. These shall make war with the... You know, maybe I should read just a little bit above this. Verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay. <clears throat> Now we're getting somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Now the tide's going to turn here, right? Everything's going to be different from here on. <clears throat> well, mm, not exactly. Uh, first of all, the beasts here, or the horns, join their power with the beast, and they're making war specifically with the lamb, not the saints. Okay? That's of note. How many of you have read this <clears throat> and assumed that this was the victory? And yet, if you'll read even the next verse after it, and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the harlot sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these uh, shall hate the harlot. The, it, there is no striking back of the lamb here. There is no victory of the lamb in the sense of seeing some act of war or, or even an action taken on behalf of him. It, it, in fact, the wording is pretty clear. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. Okay. Let's talk about that word overcome. Overcome. Anybody familiar with that word? Let's, let's keep our place here, but let's go to John chapter 16. John 16, verse 33. Last verse in <clears throat> John 16. Uh, let's do 32 and 33. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own way, and shall leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. All right. How many people have read that verse, um, that last verse, verse 33, and said, yeah, Yes, Jesus has overcome the world. Okay, you tell me at what point and how he overcame the world. I mean, how do we overcome the world? I probably got that one here somewhere, that through death 
you know, uh, what is the wording there? That through death, you, you died unto the world. Jesus didn't at any juncture Rise, raise up an army and overcome the world so that he could be king of kings and lord of lords. At no juncture. Jesus overcame the world, overcame sin, overcame the old nature, overcame, I mean, Satan through death. Am I right or wrong? I mean, the scriptures bear that out. That's, I mean, if, if someone's never heard that, that would sound foreign. But there are scriptures for each one of those things and more that flat out say it was death by the means by which he defeated Satan. Hebrews 2.14, by death that he defeated the world. Galatians 6.14, I think it is. Um, on and on and on. Uh, Romans 6, how he defeated the old nature through death. Instead of trying to make us stronger than sin, we die unto sin because he died unto sin. So the way that he overcame, I mean, the, little, the victory that we're going, if we're, if we're taking this verse out of context of the true thing that has overcome the world and will prove to be the method which is the cross then if we've done that then what we'll be doing is shouting and going don't worry we'll win don't worry Jesus is going to defeat them Jesus is going to do and yet you can't find that just like in just like in um, Revelation 17 <laughs> it just says well the lamb has overcome them He's king of king. And then it goes on and starts talking about these guys having power. And then, you know, I mean, it does. The rest of it's talking about their power and what they can do. And <laughs> All right. So uh, let's just pop around to a few scriptures. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, 21. <clears throat> to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Okay, tell me what you think that means. <laughs> That's Revelation 3, 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame, yes. And then he was ascended because the Father exalted that nature that selflessly gave to that degree. So he's saying those who bear this image of nature, you're going to you're going to be gathered to this because of being like kind. So he can say, he did overcome it as I overcame. And because I overcame, I was raised up from death and made to sit together in the Father's throne. And if you overcome, and does that mean, well, we'll beat him up, and we'll, that would be the exact opposite of what he's trying to communicate here. He wants you to overcome as he overcame. He wants you in his image. He wants you in his likeness. He wants you as wife of the of the lamb he wants you more than just a christian that believes christian principles he wants something after his own kind okay well let's do, let's do some more uh romans romans chapter 12. My statement here was, <clears throat> beasts make war with the lamb. Who will win? It says that he shall overcome them. It says of the lamb there in Romans, well, I mean, uh, Revelation 17, 14, I think it was. Uh, 
he overcomes, he overcomes them. And so I put he overcomes in the same way he did at Calvary, John 16, 33, and Revelation 3, 21, which we just read. And he overcomes the same way a lamb overcomes, Romans 12, 21. Okay, and that is the last verse. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <clears throat> Anybody see a lamb in that? Anybody? Does anybody recognize that that is not the general way of thinking? <laughs> that, that if somebody does something bad to you, forget the scriptures, do unto others as you'd have them do it. You don't need that. All you need is an old nature and a carnal mind. <laughs> they did something bad to me, I'm going to do something bad to them. I'll make them suffer. You can do that in any number of ways. Um, but Jesus is being crucified, and he says, Father, forgive them. Okay. Jesus says, if they slap you on one cheek, then turn, turn your other cheek. Jesus says, to go the extra mile. That's not teaching. That is describing his nature. You can't and won't do those things by just trying to copy the teachings of Jesus. We need more. Is anybody really convinced of that? Raise your hand if you're really convinced of it. Okay. Me too. <laughs> I'm convinced. It's not about a, Christianity is not meant, well, I don't know, it's even meant to be Christianity as we understand it. It's, it we didn't join a teaching society led by Christ. We have been made one with the Lamb of God, the one who laid down his life on the cross, the one who gave himself and expects us, you know, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to do that same thing for the brethren but not in some sort of a mental I'm going to lay down my life. If, see, if you're still trying to figure out, you know, then, and it's okay because I think a bunch of us are still, a bunch of us, <laughs> well, I do. <clears throat> then there's still a problem because we're trying to figure it out. Instead of know the Lord, just tell the Holy Spirit, look, I'm dumb. Could I pass all of this <laughs> teaching stuff and all of this and just bring me and show me his face and let me be changed into the same image? Yeah, Rob. <laughs> if the world had a general way of, of what they would call overcoming or getting the victory, the world. And they would say, well, it is, you know, if that guy steals from me, I go break his arm and then take what's mine, you know, and I'm sorry if I'm using no cliff terms, but it worked there. <clears throat> so then the church comes along and they go, well, how do we overcome? Well, we have to get the victory over. It's always over and and I don't know if you've noticed but a bunch of the more of the scriptures we'll read it'll talk about the beasts all ascending up they're all want to come up they're all working their way up and Jesus is coming down and guess who else is coming down 
the bride of Christ. Is, that's how it refers to her over and over and over. So, um, which we'll get into that in about 20 years. Because <laughs> I have a lot on that. But anyway. All right, so let's do one more verse and then we'll take a break. Uh, and that's uh, Revelation 12, verse 11. Revelation 12, verse 11. <clears throat> and then my last statement under that was, uh, well, first of all, he overcomes in the same way he did at Calvary. Jesus does. And he overcomes the same way a lamb overcomes. And he overcomes in the same way he expects us to overcome in Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the martyrdom, the word of their martyrdom, and they love not their lives unto the dead. Every ounce of that has to do with death. That's how you overcome. But it is, you know, we're not talking about physically dying. I mean, they are here. But there are deaths to be taken for others. And you don't, and I'm sorry, but in most cases you don't have to look for them. There are plenty of needs and, and what do we do? We look at the need and we see it as a lack and we see that lack as a problem instead of seeing with all those lamb's eyes and being able to look and go, you know what? Somebody, somebody needs to die here and clearly they're not going to. You know what I mean? And so you, you, you don't hesitate. You don't go, well, the, but the loss. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you, know, you don't go through all of that, that kind of stuff. You, you realize, yes, there's going to be loss, but that's never the end of it. Because God exalts the lowly. God exalts the humble. God exalts that. He, it says that over and over. And that's nothing more than God exalting the lamb. Because, but see, the lamb isn't going, well, God will exalt me, and I'll be bigger than all of them, and I'll tell them what to do. I'm going to be something someday, and so I'm going to go ahead and do this for, for God and for others. You know, he doesn't do that. Okay, we need to quit, <laughs> clearly. Yes. <laughs> 